So uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to switch over to a live demonstration and show you how the tools can actually help us find some of these issues. Welcoming Iran, who's uh, our VP of, uh, of US uh, support. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to uh, talk about a scenario with uh, an RMA. So I'm an engineer, and I've just received information that uh, we've received a return part. Someone's placed that part on a tester. Um, we've read the, uh, the ESID, the electronic chip ID from that part. And what we want to do now is we want to, first of all, go into the database and bring up all of the historical information uh, that the database has about that part, and not just about that part, but of course about everything that was being tested with that part, for example, all of the other parts in that, that same lot. And we want to look at that data uh, and try and understand what the cause was. So the report that came up is a report uh, that we call our unit level data report. It provides information across all of the operations for which this part was tested. We can see uh, e-test or what, wafer sort, final test, and so on. And I can go in here, I can configure the report to also bring, uh, bring me all of the parametric test results and so on. Uh, so I can use that data either for this particular part or for the entire wafer or the entire lot uh, to try and understand if I can find a signature that can, explain, uh, that can explain the cause of this RMA. Now, I can also take this particular RMA and I can specify in the database that it is a returned part. Okay, we can filter and we can tell the system to show us just the RMA and we can actually tell the, the system this is an RMA part, it was returned on such and such a date, I can give the reasons and so on. We can also expand the list of fields here, we can connect this to existing RMA databases as something we were doing now with a couple of customers uh, so that we can actually feed this information in automatically. The database now knows that this particular part was, uh, was an RMA. Not only that, uh, the database is also locking that data into the database. So from this point on, if, for example, our typical purging uh, of parametric data would happen after, let's say, six or nine months, depending on the customer's configuration, this data will no longer be purged. This lot has been, uh, has been marked. Uh, more than that, uh, if the data has already been purged, which, as I said before, when you're talking about uh, RMAs, the, data could, the, uh, the part could come back two years after it was manufactured, uh, we can actually go back uh, automatically to, uh, to the data log storages and reload the data so that it's all available for the engineer to analyze. So again, within minutes of me knowing that a particular part has been returned, I already have all of the data I need in order to be able to understand what the problem is. And then I can unleash the full set of optimal test tools, for example, all of the rules that we have, the escape prevention rules and so on, to try and see if there's any signature for these particular parts which can explain why uh, why they were returned. What we've done is we've set up a rule. We, we looked at this particular data and we discovered, for example, that the rule that triggered for it is what's called the probe mark count rule, which uh, catches that same issue that I was showing you in the presentation before. The probe mark count rule uh, looks at all of the layers of data that we receive about each wafer or about each lot, and it determines how many times each die was touched. Now, this includes what we call hidden, touch, uh, hidden touches or hidden touchdowns. That's a situation when you're doing parallel tests, for example, you've got a probe card which touches four die at a time. But uh, during a retest process, you're only going to see in the data log information about the bad die. You're not going to see the fact that that probe card was actually touching all of the other die uh, that, are under its, uh, that are under its pins at the same time and causing damage there. Uh, so the rule has all of the logic to be able to determine all of that. We've set up a rule. The rule has triggered. I've received an email. The email gives me all of the information I need to know about which wafer, which lot, uh, at which facility it was being tested, uh, test program, and so on. And if we scroll down on this uh, email, uh, we can see that we uh, have all of the information also about exactly which x, y coordinates uh, triggered the rule. We can see that the rule was set to a limit of uh, eight touchdowns, so we have some die here that were touched more than eight times. And of course, it's triggering only for good die. Okay, if a die is a bad die, it, it doesn't really matter. The problem is with the good die. Now, we have a, a link in the email which enables us to automatically launch the OT Portal application, which is the same application in which we discovered the problem originally. And when OT Portal launches uh, from one of these links, it actually brings with it the data that's relevant for that particular alarm. So in this case, we have a wafer. The system automatically brings up the wafer. What we're seeing here is not binning information. What we're seeing here now is the touchdown count information. We can actually see which parts have been touched too many times. Okay, and in addition to that, if we look on the left-hand side, we can see very clearly that there were multiple executions of, uh, of this wafer. It was run or resorted many times, uh, and we would like to really try and understand why. 
so the system brought up a wafer map. It also brought up another unit level data report. That's that same report which gives us all of the raw data about a particular, uh, particular wafer. Uh, we're just going to add in the probe card information as well uh, to this report because we can select which fields are, are displayed. And we're going, to, uh, we're going to run it. You can see the speed at which this, uh, this data is brought up. So now I have all of the test information for all of the parts across all of those different runs for these particular die. Uh, we can sort uh, this information by one or two fills. In this case, we're going to sort it by X and Y. So now we can clearly see we filtered it down to the specific units that were failing. And we can see, for example, this unit with X, Y coordinates 10, 12 uh, is good bin. We can see false. It failed over and over and over and over again. And eventually here, it received a bin 16, which for this this particular product is a good uh, bin. Uh, and if we look at the data, we can see very clearly that what actually happened is that someone switched out the probe card. In other words, some operator on the test floor was going against the instructions that they had been given. They were told probably only to test this way for once or twice. They had too many failures. They were testing it over and over again. Eventually, they went and uh, switched out the probe card. And hey, presto, they had great yield. But of course, in doing so, they completely damaged the parts that they were testing. Uh, and these are parts that you no longer want to send off to customers. So we saw the email. We saw how from the email we managed to get to the data in OT Portal. Now let's take a look and see how we configured that rule to provide that email. How was the system configured to enable that capability? So we're now looking at another product called OT Rules. OT Rules is the application that you use to define rules, which can either provide alerts when something is going wrong, or even perform online uh, action. So we have offline rules and we have online rules. Uh, online rules, for example, can cause a tester to pause, or they can uh, perform other actions that involve changing the flow of the test program. Someone asked before about adaptive tests. Test time reduction is one area where we actually make changes in real time to uh, effectively to the test program. We have many, many rules already in our uh, library, and these rules have been built together with our customers based on, uh, on, the com on the issues that seem to be common across the industry. Uh, and there are different types of rules. For example, yield monitor is a simple rule that uh, looks for situations where a wafer's yield is significantly higher or lower uh, than, than other typical population. We'll look at that one a little bit later. Uh, the S2S, or site-to-site -site rules, are ones which deal with parallel testing, issues with parallel testing. Uh, then we've got everything to do with escape prevention rules. For example, probe mark count is the rule that we've been talking about now. Um, passing tests with out-of-limits result is the example we saw before on, uh, uh, in that presentation. Uh, there's more complex stuff, for example, test list comparison between test program revisions. Uh, whenever a new revision of a test program comes out, we can com compare and uh, provide the engineer with information about the delta in the list of tests so that the engineer can understand it, for example, uh, he might have commented out some tests or too many tests, a typical issue that we've, we've seen in many places. Uh, and then there are more complex rules, for example, all of the outlier rules, the uh, classic uh, outlier rules such as uh, geographic part average test, GPAT, uh, the more complex rules such as NNR, nearest neighbor residual, and so on. We have uh, a very, very significant library of rules. What we're going to do now is we're going to take a look at the particular probe mark rule that uh, triggered the email that we saw before. In this particular case, uh, or for every rule we define, we define a population. The population defines which product or which uh, data uh, is relevant for this particular rule. Now, you can define the population as tightly as you want. You can, look at even, you can even set up a rule for a particular product or sub-product or a particular test program. You can also uh, define rules extremely widely so that a single rule can actually monitor everything going through the database. And again, we'll demonstrate that a little bit later. In this case, we've set it up for a particular product because we wanted to use this on demo data to, uh, uh, to show an issue. If we go into the uh, configuration of the rule, so a rule has a name, it has a description. Uh, in this case, it has uh, various different types of limits which monitor the different ways a uh, prober can impact or damage sites. Here we've set it up for, with a touchdown limit of eight. And down here we have the actions that the rule will perform when it's triggered. So the basic action is the engineering alarm. We're always going to send, or almost always going to send, uh, an email to someone when an alarm is triggered, because it obviously means that someone has been doing something wrong. Uh, but in addition, we have the more powerful capabilities. For example, enable bin assignment. OK? As I said before, the product is integrated into the subcons, into their wafer map flow. So when they send the inkless wafer map, or before they send the inkless wafer map, flow, uh, wafer map to assembly, we can intercept that wafer map 
and we can perform bin switching. We can turn those good parts, which were tested too many times, into bad parts and prevent them from getting assembled. So even if the engineer is on vacation and hasn't received that email, okay, those bad parts will not, will not reach a customer, and that's a really key feature. Um, another thing that's important to point out about that whole uh, solution is that getting the rule back to the, the, uh, the test house or the sub of the internal or external uh, test house is all completely automatic. In other words, as soon as a user has uh, created a rule like that, they can activate it. The activation process goes through a publication process, which sends the rule to the sub completely automatically. The whole thing is very, it's a very smooth operation. It's a very easy to operate operation. Now, I've created a new rule, and I want to make sure that that rule uh, is, is not going to over or under trigger based on historical data. And someone asked that question uh, during, uh, during Craig's presentation. We have a rule simulator which can take historical data. You can set it up for however much data you want. Uh, you can select the population. You just click select all, choose all of the lots that you want to uh, simulate on, and run simulation. We've, we've done this uh, demo a couple of times in the last couple of years here at ITC, so we'll save time now and not go through the whole uh, rigmarole again. But that would simply generate those same emails again, uh, or just generate data in OT Portal, which I could then go in and view to understand whether or not those rules successfully caught the issues that I was looking for. So that closes the loop, really, with the touchdown rule, uh, the overprobing rule. Uh, the other rule, another rule that we uh, deal, dealt with was the freeze rule. We showed you the example in the slide shot. This is how the, uh, the portal view from that particular rule looks like when, when you open it up. So the problem occurred. It was caught uh, immediately. The user received an email. He can go into OT portal and immediately understand what the root cause of that problem is. And from here, of course, we can use all of the capabilities of OT Portal, which we just demonstrated in previous years, to drill down, try and understand, for example, the bin, uh, uh, the bin paretos for these particular products or test programs, and try and understand the core, uh, the core issue, right? You can go all the way down to param individual parametric measurements, of course. OK, so that's, uh, that's just another example there of the way uh, we can run rules in real time or near real time in order to catch uh, escape issues and prevent bad parts from reaching customers. But one of the areas where things get really interesting is when we're trying to take data across multiple uh, operations and learn from that more about, our opera uh, more about our testing operation. So for example, we've got an example here where we've got the same product being tested at multiple uh, different insertions. It was at e-test, it was at Wafersol, it was at final test. Um, and in final test, the, uh, this particular product was reporting an electronic chip ID uh, in the data log. So we can actually use that data, and we can bring that particular final test data, retrieve that data from our database, and display it uh, effectively reconstructed in a wafer map viewer. Just a little bit about the performance of this. There were some questions once about uh, sort of how much data do we have in this database, and is this, a typ is this typical performance? Uh, in previous years, we would run this demonstration uh, over, the, over the network, uh, connected to a bunch of servers. We've done a lot, though, in the last couple of years to enhance the, um, uh, the performance of the application and shrink it down very significantly. Uh, believe it or not, everything you're seeing now is actually running on this laptop, including all of the server components, the email components, everything else. Uh, we have a database here running, the SQL Server database running here with 8,000 lots uh, of data in it, some 30 million parts, and approximately 20 billion measurements. Uh, all of that is in the database, and what you're seeing here is live retrieval of that information uh, onto the client. In, in previous years, we've done this over the network. You've seen that the performance is more or less the same. Um, so uh, the data is highly optimized. The data, data retrieval process is highly optimized, and we can handle very, very large volumes of data. Um, now, when I'm looking at this particular example, uh, if I'm just looking at this particular wafer, for example, obviously the yellow areas that we can see in the wafer are the parts that failed at wafer sort. Because again, what we're looking at here is final test data that's being mapped onto a wafer map, reconstructed on a wafer map. Uh, if I look at these couple of wafers, everything seems to be OK. But the system can also perform stacking of wafer maps. Uh, here, for example, I'm looking at a stack of the yield uh, of the 25 wafers in this particular lot. Uh, and I can see that there is a clear process pattern appearing here, which I should have been able to catch at wafer sort, but for some reason is actually uh, making its way all the way through to wafer sort. Now, I can change the view or the way that I look at this data, and instead of looking at one particular wafer, I can ask the system to show, uh, to show all of the wafers in that lot. 
So now I can see all 25 wafers, and although I looked at one or two wafers and they looked fine, I can actually see there's a whole set of different wafers here which actually do show uh, a very clear pattern uh, along the edge of the wafer. So that obviously there's something going on here that I need to, uh, that I need to deal with. Uh, in addition to that particular pattern, if we go back to the uh, consolidated view, okay, we can also see these additional stripes. I don't know if they can be seen clearly, uh, but there are these additional stripes running through the wafer here. This is actually showing us that there's some kind of probing issue that during probe, possibly, for example, a probe card alignment issue, it seems to be damaging some of the dies. You've got uh, sites one and two on the probe card, or, or sites seven and eight on the probe card, uh, seem to be damaging the parts, and that is being reflected only in final test. Uh, these kinds of issues you can only see when you can stack data uh, from final test back on a wafer sort. So uh, if you have products which are using chip IDs, uh, these kinds of capabilities are extremely powerful. And we're already building sets of rules that can actually discover these kinds of issues automatically uh, and, uh, and alert you when, when, when we see these kinds of signatures so you can actually try and catch them at wafer sort and prevent the parts from reaching final test. So uh, what we've talked about so far is everything to do with escape prevention and also how we can use uh, cross-operation capabilities in order to increase uh, the quality of the data that uh, we're dealing with, uh, or the quality of our parts. Uh, what I want to do now is I actually want to recap and go back to something we did demonstrate last year uh, for people who weren't here last year. And uh, this has turned out to be one of the really key capabilities uh, for our customers when we go back to traditional yield issues and uh, utilization issues. Um, one of the questions we get asked a lot is, I, you know, I work in a company with uh, hundreds of different products. Each of those products is running multiple operations, and each of those operations, at each of those different operations, uh, we've got uh, different yields. Okay? Uh, now, how can I configure the system to catch a situation where a wafer or a lot has lower yield than usual, and send an alarm without actually setting up an individual rule for every single product or every single test program uh, that I have. Because obviously, you know, a product which is in early stages of its uh, ramp uh, will typically have low yield. Let's say 60, 70 percent might even be considered good, whereas a product which has been running for some time should be at the 95, 98, 99 percent uh, yield level. And of course, uh, uh, if you receive 60 percent there, then you're going to really start worrying. So. We can do that using what we call baseline rules. Baseline rules are rules that calculate what should be the expected yield for the population they're looking at automatically. So here we have a rule which is called the yield monitor rule. And here it's been configured to look at absolutely everything that's running through wafer sort, no matter which product. OK? The configuration for the rule tells, it, uh, tells us that it's going to use a limit type of baseline. We could have simply set it to percent. And percent means, you know, I'm going to say 90%. If it's less than 90%, send me an alarm. But the baseline allows this automated calculation. If we go to the advanced mode here, OK? In the advanced mode, we define or configure exactly how the baseline is calculated. So in this example, we are going to take the last, at least the last 20 wafers from the same product uh, and up to the last 100 wafers. More than that is, uh, is already meaningless from the perspective of a baseline. Uh, we're only going to take ba wafers where I have enough, a significant amount of data. For example, if someone's just tested a few die on wafer for engineering purposes or whatever, we're not going to use that uh, wafer in our population. Uh, and, and here's the, really the key feature, is we're going to tell it to only use wafers that belong to the same product and sub-product that our uh, incoming data log uh, belongs to. So if there's a situation where, for example, where we're receiving data for a, a newly ramped product, we're going, to, we're going to use 20 wafers of information just from that product, which will have probably a relatively low uh, yield signature. Okay? Now, we also have the option to set the rule to treat each test program as a different population as well. But actually, we don't recommend uh, using that option because it's extremely convenient by leaving that uh, checkbox blank uh, what we can actually do is we can catch situations where a new version of a test program is having some kind of significant event uh, effect on uh, yield, either upwards or downwards, which again would typically mean that someone's written some kind of bug into the test program, okay, or dropped a test that was, uh, that was essential. Uh, the user here has a lot of control over the math being used to uh, define the centerline function and the spread function uh, that are used to calculate uh, the baseline yield for this particular product. 
and um, we can skip straight to the email that, uh, that comes as a result of this particular rule. Okay, so this is the rule that was uh, triggered for a, uh, for a particular product. Uh, the system tells me that this particular wafer had a yield of 85%. Um, if I scroll down, what I can see is that the calculation uh, based on the center line and the spread and so on uh, meant that this wafer should have had a yield of at least 89%. In other words, this is a significantly low-yielding wafer. And again, we have the links and all the ability to go from the mail back into OT Portal, bring up the wafer map, uh, drill down into the bin data, drill down into the parametric test data in order to try and understand what's, uh, what has caused the issue. Um, so what we've seen so far, uh, summarizing both the yield rule and the escape prevention rules, is we've seen rules that are triggered when a data log arrives, okay? Or in some cases, they can be triggered when uh, running uh, in real time on the tester. Now, the question is, what else can we do when we've got all of this data in the database and we want to try and ascertain if there are additional patterns in that data, which you can't detect just by looking at a, uh, at a particular uh, data log file? So, for example, test time comparison rule, or what we call a cross rule. The cross rule is a generic rule that enables us to take any measure that we collect over any population in the database and determine if it is statistically different from the rest of the data. For example, in this particular case, we've configured the rule uh, to look at a measure called good test time. It's going to trigger once a day. This, this one's not triggered by incoming data. It's triggered on a schedule. Um, we've selected it to look at the good test time measure, which is something that we uh, calculate based on the information in the data log, the average good test time for the part. Um, we can tell the system to use this particular rule, in this case, to compare testers, but in the, same method, in the same way, we could be using it to compare probers, probe cards, load boards, et cetera, any kinds of equipment. And of course, we can set up multiple rules uh, to cover all of those different scenarios. Uh, and we can also tell the system how to treat different groups of data. So for example, by product, by operation, uh, by test program, or whatever, to make sure that the data, uh, again, is coherent and makes sense. So once I've set up a rule like that, uh, and it triggers, again, we'll go straight to the email, save the uh, simulation stage. Okay, this is an example of a trigger that this rule would send. And again, this is something now that if you think about it, it's looked at all of the data from the last 24 hours, uh, and it's ascertained that I have a problem, in this case, with six different testers on five different products. Okay, and here at the top of the table, I've got a summary which is explaining uh, which, the, which testers and which products currently have some kind of test time issue. Let's go scroll down here to the last example uh, in the email. So uh, here we have an example, for example, for the product called Condor. You can see it's split by groups, product equals Condor. Okay, it was tested on uh, five, or five different testers. Each of those testers was testing anywhere between, you can see, 30, 40, uh, 100, uh, 160 uh, lots. And we can see that the average test time on tester number 33 was over a second longer than the test time on, uh, on the other testers. Now, of course, this is something I want to deal with because it's costing me money. I'm paying for test time. Uh, and this tester is just running slow. It's, causing, it's costing me low th uh, throughput and so on. We can bring up the data from, again, just by clicking the link in that email, we can bring up the relevant data uh, in, from our database. And here, for example, it gives us automatically a box plot uh, showing us the distribution of test time across those different testers for this particular product. And this is a clear example where it wasn't caused by, uh, by one or two uh, slow lots or something like that. You can see very clearly the entire population is significantly, uh, for, for that particular tester, is significantly above the averages for the other testers. I can see this is a clear outlier, and I can now go contact the subcon and try and understand why is that tester performing uh, so much slower than, uh, than all of the others. One more example we have to show, and this is no longer related to rules, is another, another advantage of having all of this data available in the database. The data we collect can give you an extremely accurate picture of the performance of your organization. Taking this up now to the management level, okay? Think about it, you've got all of the data logs. We don't just know what you think the average test time was going to be for your products. We can tell you exactly what the average test time for your products was going to be. We don't tell you roughly what the yield uh, should have been based on some kind of statistics. We can tell you exactly what the yield was. And when, then we can bring this up into this kind of dashboard view. And again, the, these views are highly customizable. 
In this particular case, uh, we integrated with a customer uh, with an existing BI system that they have, and there are several of these systems, for example, things like uh, IBM's Cognos or PeopleSoft, Agile, various products that uh, contain the, the, key, the key performance indicators, the KPIs uh, that the various organizations use. We actually have a system now that allows us to import that data into our database. And of course, this is time-sensitive data. It can change as the time progresses, weekly, monthly, or quarterly, or whatever. And we can then show our managers a very clear dashboard with uh, stoplights, green, yellow, red, or uh, gradients, and so on, charts, etc. We can show them exactly how their, product, uh, their products are performing against their baselines. And of course, this is an extremely useful tool uh, for planning departments. Okay, you think you know what you can ship. Can you really ship it? Well, let's go and have a look at the data, and from there we can understand. We're beginning to see a lot of use in, in some of the organizations where uh, senior managers are actually pulling up these dashboards in weekly meetings, um, and then asking their engineers to explain why some of those colors aren't green. Uh, and of course, that has also driven up the usage of the tools very substantially, because all the engineers are spending their week going through these dashboards in advance to make sure that everything's going to be green. Uh, and the overall impact is a very significant impact on uh, the efficiency of the organization, uh, on the planning capabilities of the organization. Uh, what we've seen over, over time, and again, Craig from NVIDIA and uh, our previous presenters from other companies in the last few years have talked about this a lot. It has a huge impact on yield. It has a huge impact on efficiency. It has a huge impact also, of course, today now on quality as well. Now, uh, over the next year, as uh, Craig hinted, we're going to be dealing with uh, a bunch of, or we're going to be delivering a bunch of new capabilities, for example, the virtual test capability that he described, and uh, some kind of uh, power, well, quite a powerful uh, scripting uh, environment and analysis and environment to help automate a lot more of the tasks that uh, we're doing here. Um, so come back next year, we'll be making, I think, a very exciting uh, presentation about that, where we'll show a lot of new capabilities um, and really building on the data feed forward capabilities, all of this uh, capability to take data from one operation to the next, uh, to combine information from different areas, uh, parametric tests, uh, wafer geography, uh, e-test, and so on and so on, in order to build a very clear quality picture about every part that we're shipping. That's my presentation today. Thank you very much. If there are any questions.